Um, I want to thank everybody for coming, and I want to thank in particular Ryan and Rachel, um, the owners of Zion's Books, for hosting this event, for hosting these events. I want to briefly introduce um, our panelists and then just give them the floor for the rest of the uh, evening. When, when they're done, I think, we'll probably, I think we'll hear from both Alan and is it Hal? Hal. Um, and then we will, uh, uh, Richard will have a chance to respond and there could probably be some dialogue, but also we would encourage the audience to, to ask questions and be a part of the conversation. So, um, Alan Hurst, I asked Alan to participate tonight. Alan and I have been friends and colleagues for some time now, and Alan is one of my most faithful conservative interlocutors and most thoughtful conservative interlocutors. So, um, Alan is uh, actually a graduate of the political science department at BYU, where he uh, inexcusably failed to take any classes from Richard. Uh, also a graduate from Yale Law School, He's held fellowships at Yale Divinity School and at J. Ruby Clark Law School, where he taught, I think it was property law. Um, he's currently clerking at the uh, Utah State Supreme Court and working on legal scholarship. He has a forthcoming article on separationism uh, in the BYU Law Review. And... Um, Am I missing anything? Not really, no. and, 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 and he and his wife had a baby this week. Congratulations. So, Ten days ago. Ten days ago. Okay. Last, last week. So he's on uh, paternity leave. So he had time to spend some time with Richard's book. Um, Richard needs no introduction, but Richard is the author of the book. Um, he's the reason why we're here. He is the uh, a respected political scientist and uh, professor of political science at Brigham Young University. Uh, long career in political activism. Um, former chair of Utah County Democrats. He has talked a lot of people into getting involved in politics, including the man to his left, Hal Miller. Miller. Hal Miller, who is a professor of psychology at Brigham Young University, a proud recruit of Richards, and um, has also been politically involved, uh, including serving as the president of the Utah National Parks um, Division Council, Council for uh, the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, so I'm just going to now turn the evening over to them. I, like I said, I assume we'll hear from Alan first and then from Hal, and then Richard will have a chance to respond and we can all be a part of this. Um, well, I wasn't really expecting to go first, but I can anyway, and I'm glad to. Uh, thanks for writing the book. Um, it, was, it was good to read it. Um, I, there were a lot of things about it I appreciated. I loved reading the history in particular of Mormons and politics, and kind of you know a bit of a discussion as to how Mormons became you know identified with the Republican Party and conservatives and generally. Um, I, I think it's difficult for Mormons of my generation to realize that that's the case. To realize this is a fairly new thing, and the church has not always been identified you know popularly the way it's been identified now. Um, and related to that, I really like to plea for. Uh, you know, recognition of political diversity inside of religious unity, this idea that, that we don't need to be politically monolithic and that conservatives in the church really deep need to do more to recognize liberals in the church. I like the discussion of economic inequality. Um, I think this is something, I think you do a great job showing this, where this mattered a lot to the early church. This matters a lot in the Doctrine of Covenants. And I don't think it matters nearly as much as it ought to to a lot of modern-day Mormons. And you make a great argument about that. Um, so, again, I'm glad you wrote the book. Uh, and I hope it starts lots of conversations. Um, now, that said, uh, you don't invite a thoughtful conservative to an event like this one just so that you can agree with everything. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 
some, some responses, some critiques, some places where substantively I wasn't persuaded. Um, one of them was, uh, I mean, you, you, you recognize that liberality of spirit and liberalism of politics aren't, aren't the same thing exactly. Um, but still, you know, as, as someone who hopes he's, he's uh, a liberal soul in all the good senses, uh, or at least most of them, I'm sure some of them I definitely need to work on, um, you know, I, I, it still jarred me a little bit to see that put together so much. And I thought, you know, what, what bothers me so much about this line you're drawing from liberal soul to liberal politics? And I think what it came down to for me was uh, that I, I really don't think that liberals on the whole, political liberals in the U.S. on the whole, are more conservative, than, or sorry, more compassionate, more uh, generous than political conservatives on the whole. I, I think that the difference is more that they're compassionate and generous toward different people. Um, that, you know, I, I think you see this really clearly in affirmative action debates where, you know, political liberals care a lot about discrimination against racial minorities and against women, and political conservatives care a lot about uh, discrimination against, say, rural whites, which happens, and discrimination against, you know, local Christians, which happens. And liberals tend not to care about these things the same way conservatives tend not to care about discrimination against racial minorities. Um, I think you see it in uh, you know, the, the, the most painful place for me to see it is in the abortion debate, where um, I look at people on my side and I see just a shameful lack of compassion for women in a situation where they would where they would feel compelled to get an abortion. Um, just total lack of recognition for the situations they're in and the way that society and everybody has really failed these women. On the other hand, I look at some of the lengths that that, that uh, liberals will go to to avoid uh, feeling any compassion whatsoever for the aborted fetuses, and I find them sickening, honestly. And so I look at this and I see, again, I, I don't think it's so much a matter of who is more compassionate. I think it's who is compassionate toward whom, honestly, determines a lot of this. But getting even in more into the substance, um, I see my main objection to the book, or the main point where I, you know, the, as, as a conservative, wasn't persuaded, was I, I think you're absolutely right that libertarians um, and a strong, you know, kind of the dominant Mormon political culture tend to draw way too sharp a distinction between society and government, and, and uh, tend to see way more opposition between society and government than, than there really is or ought to be. But I kept feeling while reading the book that, that here there's too little. You know, here, here there's, there's um, not a lot of recognition of the important ways where, where society and government are distinct and where the two don't necessarily get along. Um, and where, you know, government as an agent of good is, is really inferior to, to private choice, private action as an agent of good. Um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of these. I think one of them is control. You know, that, that if I, you know, imagine you know, if I had a choice between uh, dedicating a certain percentage of my, my income to charity myself or giving it to the government and having the government do it, um, you know, how, how would I be different one way or the other? Well, control-wise, if I did it myself, then I would be able to, to influence and control where it went. But if I didn't, or if I give it to the government, then some of it's going to get spent in ways that I think are good, and some of it's probably going to get spent in ways I think are terrible. And I don't have any control over that. Um, uh, and then you think also about the effect that the giving has on me. You know, um, I think you're right to, to point out that, that libertarians put way too much emphasis on compulsion and how it's terrible for the government to force people to do good or punish people for not doing good. And, and the truth is, you know, we do that all the time, and we have to do that all the time. That's why society works, is because government punishes people for not being good. Um, but still, if I simply see a, a certain percentage of my paycheck disappear every month, um, without any particular thought as to where it's going, who needs it, how it's being used, um, the effect on me as an individual is going to be massively different than if I chose to give that up. If I, if I chose, you know, I really could buy these things for myself, but instead I'm going to give them to the poor. This has a much greater spiritual effect on me than even if I willingly 
give this money, even if I vote for a Democratic candidate who taxes me and gives this money to the poor, I think that if I do it myself, I'm better off. And not just, I'm better off. Probably if I do it myself, there's a good chance I'm going to do it through some association or group of which I'm a part. And my charitable endeavors will, will mix with theirs, and I will work with them to accomplish good things in the world. Whereas, I think it's easier when it's just money disappearing from your paycheck to say, eh, they're being taken care of. I don't need to worry about it. Um, anyway, I, I, I worry about taking too long here. Uh, I'll skip a few things in kind of what I applied, but the last thing I want to say is I, I worry about another big difference between government doing good and the rest of society doing good. Um, beyond just that I can't control what the government does with my money, beyond just that uh, when I do good myself, I tie myself to other people, and when the government does good with my money, I'm not tied to other people in any way. Um, beyond those things, there's also just the fact of court that libertarians, you know, make, I think, again, much too big a deal about the government forcing people to pay their taxes, etc. But still, the fact of government forcing people to do good has some dangerous side effects. I don't think it, it's in principle avoidable the way some people want it to be. But as I read your discussion of people, you know, for religious reasons, trying to use the government to do good, I, I thought of two sets of people in the 19th century who, you know, similarly wanted to use the government to do good. And one of these sets of people, you know, saw what they saw, saw what they thought of as an underprivileged, needy underclass who needed the government's help. And they, horrifyingly to our modern eyes and ears, thought the solution to this problem was a continuation of slavery, that we need slavery in order to help the slaves. Obviously, many people just said this and didn't really believe this, but a lot of people really believed this. They believed that this was the best way for the government to take care for the, uh, the life and education and moral uh, development of these people was to leave them enslaved. And people really believed that. And they were horribly, horrifyingly wrong, but their beliefs carried the day for a long time and ruined a lot of lives. On the other side of the same debate, you had people who had a similar feeling in the opposite direction. They were convinced that slavery was wrong, that it was evil, that it was contrary to their religion, and that the best thing government could do would be to abolish it. This same group of people has left its mark on American society in a lot of other ways. They've uh, this movement was strongly associated with the rise of public schools in America and public universities. Um, uh, they battled, you know, they, they banned pornography, they fought against alcohol and, and led to prohibition. There were all sorts of ways in which they tried to use government to improve society. Um, and, you know, when you look at the abolition of slavery and the 14th Amendment and such, there are lots of ways in which they succeeded. But, relevantly to this audience, Another one of the ways they tried to use the government to improve society was to stamp out religious minorities, or, or do what they could to hinder religious minorities. They, they wiped out Native American religions because they thought these were hindering people's development and they were bad for the people in them. Um, they did everything they could against to fight against the public Catholicism in America because they didn't think that Catholics were good Republicans. They thought these people would be better off if they were Catholic and so were not going to allow support of Catholicism. And, of course, they came out to Utah, and they tried to extinguish the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, not just in polygamy, but destroy the church. And the reason they did this was, sure, some of it was bias, some of it was prejudice, some of it was they didn't have respect for equality, but some of it was they thought that this institution was committing great evils in American society, that it was oppressing women, that it was keeping people in poverty, that it was preventing people from getting educated and becoming free equal citizens in the United States. And because of all these things, they thought this institution needs to be eradicated. And so these people, who in their minds were, who thought themselves very good people, um, and who did, through their moral motivations, their desire to use the government for good, accomplish great things in America, also accomplished really horrible things in America. And so the greater power of government to do good, the power of government to, you know, for example, raise the standard of living of the poor far beyond what private charity could ever do. It comes along with the power of government to oppress and destroy and all of it in the name of good. And that worries me, and that is probably ultimately why I'm concerned with So. Richard. 
Richard introduced his book to me about a year ago. It was in draft form. I don't know which draft it would have been, but I assume an early draft. And he asked me to uh, peruse it, but instead I read it closely and responded to his invitation by asking him whether he wanted me to serve as a, in a kind of editorial posture toward the draft, or if it was meant, uh, if, if he was depending uh, more on my general uh, impressions. But I did read it closely in case he, he uh, wished to have a closer reading. It turned out that that wasn't important to him, it was more just a general impression. I recall that my first question to him in, uh, in that uh, response was to say, what is this about? Why are you writing the book? For whom is it meant? What do you hope to accomplish by it? Because it, the, there was, for me, not a clear answer to those questions in what I had read. I could surmise, uh, I could speculate, the intent of the book uh, was uh, not, uh, in my opinion, expressed all that cleanly. Since then, and, and I've not seen the book in the published form until I walked through the door this evening, I thought a good deal more about uh, what that intent might be. It seems to me that within the book there is a theory Proposed now by someone who is uh, an astute political thinker, political scholar. There's a theory about why present day Utah is a one party state. Now, that, that theory is not necessarily articulated. Uh, in, you know, it, it doesn't figure in the book per se, but I think it's there. And so, someone who has an interest in that phenomenon and in wondering about whether it is pendulum-like or if it's here to stay uh, even longer than it has already stayed, uh, then one, I think, could read this book uh, profitably and find that theory in place. More important, though, for his purposes, I think, is to extend a gentle invitation to individuals not otherwise inclined to think about their politics vis-a-vis -vis their own personal moral or ethical philosophies and their own uh, religious orientation. I see this as a gentle book, a gentle invitation, possibly calculated to nudge what I hope will be an appreciable segment of, the states, of this state's population. Uh, that is, ignoring the fact that the book is written at large to, uh, to, to Latter-day Saints and, and, and persons of comparable faith otherwise. But it will not nudge them toward a more uh, careful inspection of how they have come by their uh, political, philosophical inclinations, whether those inclinations are simply borrowed uh, and taken for granted, sort of borrowed from the parental generation, borrowed from the popular media, uh, borrowed from the uh, stature struck by authority figures in the LDS Church and otherwise, or, or whether their, their leanings are more deeply founded. And, and scholar as he is, my guess is that he, he, he's wishing for that deeper founding of, of these personal uh, philosophies and principles. And so it is in a series of chapters uh, directed toward a series of issues. <clears throat> He is, in essence, appealing to the reader who might come to the book with uh, uh, some aversion and some disinclination to, 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 to come and reason together, as it were. 
consider uh, uh, this uh, historical background that you may be unaware of. Consider the philosophical issues at work in this in, in this particular issue, with this particular phenomenon, and the uh, and consider the possibility that there are issues here or sides of the issue that you have not inspected with any carefulness before. And, and, and if you do so, see if you are not inclined to uh, allow some disturbing of what you have taken so long for granted and assumed to be the case, and see if perhaps you might be nudged to a different, new, possibly liberating uh, perspective. as a teacher, but that is someone who's made his living for a long time as a teacher, uh, I, I, I necessarily must applaud that, that kind of interest on the part of the author. This is a, a liberal publication in, in, in the finest sense. It's meant to, to, to uh, call into question it's meant to unsettle. It's meant to open eyes and hearts, and ultimately to uh, allow individuals the opportunity through their own thinking and sifting way uh, to find themselves in a better position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I. Uh, I realize now that I'm more liberal in different ways than I thought I was uh, <laughs> to write a book that was liberal in different ways. Um, so this, let me explain why I decided to write this book. It really has been preying on me for a long time, I, many years. I've thought about the fact that there was not in the literature something that was close to my views. And there's, there's, you know, there's books about the compassionate society, but not from the perspective of Elia Stalker. There are books about politics um, and Elia Stalker, but they're not from my perspective. I didn't see. I don't see Elia Stalker in that way. So there seemed to be a hole there in the literature, and I thought I'm probably not the only one who sees that hole or feels that there's something missing here or feels like there needs to be something written that might uh, explain why they think the way they do. So uh, it, it, I thought about this for a long time. I really ought to write a book like this, uh, it, just explaining my views, why it is that I see the gospel and politics in this way. Uh, and maybe there would be other people who would be interested. So when I pitched the book to Greg Hoford, the response was very positive right off. I, it, it reassured me that I wasn't the only one who had the sense that there was this hole there. Um, and and uh, so when I started to write the book, which was, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three years ago, uh, I finally decided I, I need to actually write this book. Um, I thought, who am I writing this book for? It's just for me. Well, it's going to sell one copy. Actually, I'm just going to get a free one. You know? So it's not going to... I don't think it would be worth anything. Who do I want to write this for? And I realized I want to write this for uh, the average church member. Basically, the people who are sitting in a Sunday school class with me and high priest group with me, who are who uh, hear occasionally uh, comments from other high priest or Sunday school class members about politics, and just sort of accept, well, that's the way it is. That's, you know, they're, they're telling the truth about how that connection is. And, and I thought, I need to write to them. I need to write to these people. Now, whether they will read it or not, I don't know. But I think there will be enough open-minded folks out there in the church who will say, I'd like to understand how these people think about politics. At first, I, I, I'm sort of surprised there are people out there who think that way about politics, different from the standard. Uh, and now I'd like to know why they think that way. And my, in my conversations with uh, people, 
and they find out that I'm a Democrat um, after they first want to look in the wallet to see if the tech recommends is really there. Uh, then, you know, it's sort of like, I, I think the next question that they want to ask, but not one that they feel like is socially proper to do, which is, why? Why would you be a Democrat? And sometimes people have asked that question. Why would, why would you be a Democrat and the LDS? Uh, in fact, I remember going to dinner with uh, uh, a friend who I had not seen for a long time, uh, never met his wife, and, and we were sitting there, and, and uh, he said that I taught political science at BYU, and she then said, oh, politics, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I just don't understand. She didn't know who I was. But no, I just don't understand how someone could be a Democrat and be a member of the church. <laughs> Our husband turned to her and said, not only is that the case, but he's the chair of the county Democratic Party. Whoa, the whole air just went out of the room. You know, she, she's just, but but I, I then use that opportunity to try to explain why you know, I would be a Democrat and be LDS. Uh, so it was clear to me that there was a need to do this, and and I hope that that's the audience that I that I actually reach here. It is not designed for academics. It's not designed for intellectuals. Uh, someone who um, wants to get some something uh, deeper uh, in terms of political thought is going to come away disappointed because that's not the audience that I'm trying to reach. I'm trying to reach the average church member who has some interest in politics and kind of wants to know uh, somewhat about what's going on in the world and only sees one perspective. Uh, because that's all they're exposed to, is one perspective. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the, the criticisms, I, I agree that um, I probably don't separate government and society enough you know, I, what I was trying to do was to talk to these people, uh, not not you, uh, but to the other people who who see complete separation between the two. And I was trying to join them, press, you know, go overboard in that to show that they are actually connected. Uh, in terms of the uh, issue about whether um, I don't know whether I do that very well, I, I think that's a good I think that's a good argument to make um, about whether I. I I, I go too far in trying to say that. Um, in terms of the issue of propulsion on uh, taxes and other issues, uh, other, other ways in which government compels, and I do give examples of how we get compelled to do things that, that libertarians don't tend to complain about. Uh, but I guess my response to that is, uh, does it help me or do I not actually get affected by taxes being taken out and government using those taxes for good purposes? Uh, I think it just depends on how you see it. And, and I try in the book to show these are the things how government impacts your life in a positive way. I, I don't know if you remember that, you know, that whole uh, description of the day in the life of the average citizen. So I'll explain it to you who haven't read. Uh, so I, I say, you know, the average citizen gets up in the morning and they go about their day and they probably don't think about the fact that um, the police were patrolling in their neighborhood that night. And so government, through the police, was actually already working. They probably weren't thinking about the fact that in the night their, their country was not invaded by some foreign army. They weren't talking, they, they, if there was some kind of a natural disaster, that there wasn't uh, a civil defense operation in place. When they then get up and they go to work, they drive on roads that were built by the government and maintained by the government. Uh, they probably drop their kids off at school. Well, who runs that school? Uh, and if they have older children, they, they're going off to college. Well, it's likely to be, except where I work, uh, and you work. Uh, a public university run by government. Uh, so they don't even think about these things. We, we don't. We, and, and that's the beauty of it. If you don't have to think about it, that means the government is actually working in your behalf. Uh, and those dangers that could happen to you, I mean, that, why is it that your house stays intact? Is it because uh, necessarily developer, all developers are good and honest people? No, it's because they have to abide by codes. Well, whose codes are those? 
other government codes. So in so many ways, there is that, that connection there. So I think people say, well, we'll, we'll think government is bad because that's what they normally see. They see the scandals. They see the taxes that they have to pay in April, and I feel the same way. When I have to write out that check, uh, uh, it, it, I, I pause and think, well, man, there's a lot of money that I'm having to pay for taxes. And I have to think about, is there a good to this? But I think if you think about that, if you think about, well, there, are, there is good, is it, completely un, uh, is it completely good? No. Are there programs that I don't agree with? Yes. Uh, is there waste? Absolutely. But on the whole, the principle is, yes, it's good. It goes towards good things. And many of those things actually touch my life directly. And so if people think about that, then, then uh, they can, I think, be benefited by that kind of a, an attitude. Um, is it the case that they should see that as a substitute? No. For their own giving? And I think I make that point, that really there's these three levels, right? There's the individual level, that we should be liberal souls on an individual level, giving to others, serving others, uh, using our time and talents and energy in order to help others. There's the group level, the organizational level, uh, and certainly the LDS Church falls in this category. The Boy Scouts fall in this category. Lots of private organizations fall in this category, doing good through that. But that's where many people stop and say, that's it. Government doesn't do good. And, and I, I say in this book, no, there's a third level as well. And that's the societal level. And, and then, so I go over work probably and say, but that's also government. Government is a tool of that society to try to do good. And if we say it's only at the, these two levels, then I think there's a lot of good that isn't going to happen, that cannot happen, because it can only really happen at the societal level. Uh, we can only really uh, regulate behavior at the societal level uh, in, in some ways. Or sometimes we can only help people uh, at that level. So uh, I see, for example, healthcare, um, where a neighborhood, so an individual family gets a catastrophic illness. The family can't deal with that. The individual can't deal with it. The family can't deal with it. Uh, the neighborhood, can they get together you know, and raise $20,000? Sure, that'd be wonderful to do. But what if the bill is, is, is a half million dollars? I mean, what then? And I think that's where the society as a whole comes in, and government as its tool, and plays a role, a positive role, to be able to help in those kinds of situations. And they're not, they're not uh, infinitesimal in number. Um, so I think that's, that's my uh, interest here, is to say to people who who will stop at, this, at the group level and say, you know, I will do things with my family. Um, I will do things with my, my neighborhood or my group, which is sort of a tribal approach to, uh, to life. And I won't do anything with the society. The society doesn't have any business. Um, that, those people I, I, I want to deal with. And does government regulation of behavior sometimes go awry? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, but I don't think that those, and I see them as exceptions, I don't think that those exceptions suggest that the rules should not be followed, that government can play a positive role, because we can, we can probably point out many cases where government wasn't there and things went badly. And you, the, the, the 19th century, again, is a good example of that. Uh, and I think that's actually true of the internet today where many people are getting harmed by what's going on online, uh, and government is not playing a role to try to stop that from happening, um, from child pornography to invasion of privacy. So uh, that, that's the purpose for the book. Um, I appreciate you coming. Uh, I appreciate uh, your, your interest. Uh, and I'll turn it over to, to Brad or uh, questions. Or well, I actually have a question. Uh, a couple questions that I want to start with. So um, I, I kind of want to hold your and Alan's feet both to the fire a little bit on some of the things, uh, 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 on something that each of you said. Um, so for um, for you, Richard, um, I would like you to respond to um, the following. 
as you as you 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 sat there, you made a case for um, the good the government can do. And first of all, let's agree that. And as as as, as a, just a matter of personal disclosure, I'm a really really left to center guy. So I'm, this is as much as in the spirit of dialogue as anything else. But I would I would really like to hear you articulate an answer. We can agree that. There's a lot of common ground between liberals and conservatives about some of the good the government can do. Liberals and conservatives agree that governments are great for national defense and a number of other things. But they also strongly disagree about whether the government is good at doing other things and whether the government is, is capable of doing certain kinds of good. And so what I would like you to respond to is what I think is a sort of a, a, the, a, a good faith um, conservative a good faith representation of a conservative um, objection to your argument, which is that it's not that conservatives don't believe that those goods that you list are important things to provide. It's that on balance, they believe that those things are better provided by things like market structures, for example. So poverty alleviation is, on the whole aggregate going to um, going to go better if markets are allowed to work with not absolute non-intrusion but with less regulation and intrusion. In other words, it's not at all a disagreement about whether we should be concerned about providing these things. It's a disagreement about whether or not the government or um, the non-government is better at providing those things. Um, and then I want to ask Alan a question. So I don't know if you want to respond, and then I can pose the question to Alan, or if you want me to ask the question to Alan and turn it over to both of you. Yeah, go ahead. So my question for you, Alan, is about this issue of coercion. And I think you articulated two sides of it that, um, that I tend to hear a lot out of conservative circles. One is the coercion in terms of the government's relationship to the taxed individual. And so there's this kind of, this, uh, uh, this standard objection that that if you're forcing me to give charitably, that's not real charity. If you're forcing me by taking money from me to help others, that's not real charity, that's not real help. And then the other side of it is the a sort of a, a, a much more macro coercion, which is the idea that you articulated quite well, that a government that is capable of acting for good also by virtue of having that power, that ability to act to do good, also is capable of acting to do badly. And sometimes when we empower the government to do good things, we also do it in a foolhardy way or even in a very frightening way. So my, uh, what I would like you to respond to are um, objections to both of those, those sort of those concerns. On the side of the individual, the objection that I would raise is it's not about that individual at all, right? So it's not, if you, if you frame it in terms of charity, it's force isn't real, it's, from, from my perspective, it's totally irrelevant. I don't care if it's real charity or not. All I care is that it's feeding somebody. I don't care what you call, I don't care, I, I don't care if it has any positive effect on you as the person being taxed. I couldn't care less. The other uh, objection is, um, on the side of government coercion and a government that's capable of acting is capable of acting in a, in a harmful way. I think the answer to that is something that conservatives also tend to object to a lot, and that's bureaucracy. In other words, bureaucracy tends to be a boogeyman for gover for conservatives because it's, it's emblematic of how, it, how difficult it is for government to act, how, how, how inefficient government is when it tries to do anything. It's going to, you know, government's going to go try to do this little project that's going to involve three separate agencies and, and four different carbon copies of a form, and it's going to be the, the least efficient thing. But a system that, that, that's, that's that inefficient is a system that's very, very difficult to abuse in a, in a kind of tyrannical way, in a kind of horrifying way. Because not one single person can just take it over. You know, we're not going to elect a president who's suddenly going to be capable of using the government to just, like, do Hitler-like things. Because bureaucracy is itself a check 
against the government's ability to efficiently murder us. So that's my the object the, the objection that I'd like you to respond to. So Richard first. So your question uh, is, um, uh, how do you answer someone who says, "Well, the private market can can provide these goods better"? Right. We better. trust we trust markets to better do X, Y, or Z than we trust. Because not that we don't think it's important. We just think that. And by the way, that's a fairly recent kind of uh, an attitude. I think it is too. I think back, uh, kind of neoclassical back, economics has made right. a big case for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, if you go back to the Great Depression, for example. You, you don't get that sense at all. The, no. the, the markets work very well, and the government doesn't play very much of a role. Yeah. So, and I think that that's basically. Hoover was a very liberal candidate. He just was like he wanted the government to help people, for sure. It was just that um, Ro Ro Roosevelt was was much more you know he, he was he approached it differently. But it's not as if Hoover was saying markets can just solve this problem. Nobody really thought. Yes. That. Yes, that's true. Uh, but but uh, I think it really gets back to the fact that markets uh, are not there to serve human interest. I mean, they, they may indirectly do so, right. but they don't directly do so. Whereas government's role is to do is exactly that. So those kinds of, of areas where markets function, but they hurt human interest, uh, sometimes they, I mean, they very much they will help. And they will they will uh, work to ameliorate people's economic situation, and that's wonderful. But sometimes they will hurt interest. The example of that would be the relationship with labor. Yeah. You know where uh, businesses will say, you know, we need to pay our employees as little as we can get away with, uh, so that we can make the best profit we can, so our shareholders are happy with us. Blah blah blah. Uh, that that kind of uh, thinking doesn't help the, the humans who actually work for those companies. Uh, and that's where government has to come in and provide some help for those who are hindered, and particularly in a kind of society. I mean, if you were to go back 500 years where, where we had you know, s small craftsmen and uh, people were on basically more of an equal level with each other in terms of you know, the candlestick maker and the butcher and the baker and all those people, uh, then they, were, they, they could interact with each other uh, in a commercial way, in more or less an equal way. But that's not true today. I mean, each of us is a, uh, likely to be an employee of some large institution. And that institution, compared to us, is just gargantuan. And, and even though unions may come together in order to help collect a bargain, but what does that market do? It tries to stop that from happening. And that's where government comes in. Uh, or, so if you take something where society uh, determines that um, the market isn't doing this well, I think that's where that's okay. particularly where government has to play that kind of role. I think healthcare falls in that category. I do too, for me because personally. Health, I agree. Yeah, yeah. At least catastrophic health. Because yeah. healthcare doesn't uh, because healthcare in, involves people who are not well off. Uh, otherwise, you probably wouldn't use it. Uh, insurance industries, the insurance industry has no incentive to cover you if you are going to be a drain on them economically. And yet, this is a human interest again. And so the government has to come in, I think, and say, no, we can't allow that to happen because these people will be without. And we have to help them provide, we have to provide for them in some way, if not health care, health insurance, so they have access to health care. So I think that's I think it's sort of where the market doesn't work well at this would be one way to say that, uh, and I think another is you have to have an umbrella of government control over the over the economic uh, intercourse of people, because otherwise the markets will have a tendency to go awry, uh, even if they're acting within economic cycles. Uh, you know you know what. Franklin Roosevelt said people don't eat in the long run. No, people people need to have uh, the basics now. And and they can't survive as a corporation might be able to the long run. You know, the economic downturn that takes place. That's great. Yeah, um, <clears throat> sorry, slipping into your answer. Uh, 
Well, first off, I'd like to respond to your earlier response and say, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's there's so much there's so much government um, isn't the solution to the problem. Government is the problem. You know that that kind of rhetoric has has just kind of taken on a life of its own and run away with a substantial wing of the Republican Party nationwide and in Utah to the extent that people just can't even see those things that government does well without, you know, if, and if, they're, if, if their attention is called to them, then they'll just say, well, you know, markets could do that better. But, um, you know, but, but just even more radical critique of markets than one you just gave is, is that markets are always secondary. Markets are always derivative. You, you can't have a market to establish people's property rights. People have to have property rights before they come to the market. Yeah. And how do you get property rights? Well, there are two ways. One of them is you can have a government that establishes laws that tells you what, you know, who owns what and establishes property rights. And the other one is you have a bunch of people with guns. Who say, all all against all, all, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so markets, you know, the, the idea that markets can by themselves do good, um, I, you know, as a lawyer, I just can't start with that. Because to me, a market is always a creature of and constrained by law. Um, and law is a creature of government. Yeah. Um, but okay, getting, getting to your your questions for me, uh, the forced charity is not real charity thing. Uh, my remarks on, on this point were uh, partially a response to the to the language in the book uh, talking about um, you know Zion society and avoiding the sins of selfishness and and things like this, and, and whether government action actually helps people avoid the sins of selfishness, uh, makes people one, et cetera. And, In other words, that we can actually see paying taxes as an act of charity on our own part. Right, right. And, and so partially I was responding to that. Um, I, I, would, I would look, I'll, I'll just say how I look at it. I look at it like this. Um, each of us has an individual responsibility to help the poor. And society as a whole has a collective responsibility to make sure the poor are taken care of. I, I think both of those things I can ground pretty cleanly in scripture, and I believe it will. Um, now, uh, in an ideal, you know, in a perfect Zion world, maybe there would be no need for the society level stuff, because maybe individuals would be so anxious to go about doing good. Um, so, so you know, maybe everybody's first hobby when they got off work, you know, would be how much money do I have to spend on charity this week, and who can I give it to, um, you know? In that kind of a world, maybe it would be possible not to have the society level stuff. Um, in, in this world, that's not the case. We, we absolutely have to have government help. And, and so I look at, at Social Security and uh, you know, welfare payments, etc. I look at these as both a credit to our society and kind of a criticism. You know, uh, they're, they're, they're an honor to our society in that we as a society have decided to take better care of the poor than we have done in the past. And at the same time, they're a discredit to our society because they're a sign that none of us individually cared enough about it to really do it ourselves, or not enough of us did. Right. Yes. There was a problem to begin with. Right. Right. And so, so I think the first question is the question that you know, the, the first thing to care about is the thing that you cared about, which is, is everybody eating? And if not everybody's eating, then we've got a problem. We've got to fix it. Who cares? You know, about about people's, uh, you know, whether this is real charity or not. I totally agree. Um, I. That said, uh, there are better and worse ways to make sure that everybody gets to eat. There are better and worse ways to make sure that, that healthcare is provided for everyone, etc. cetera. Uh, and I think that as necessary as the government approach to these problems is in this world, it has substantial costs. One of them is that it separates people from, uh, that, that separates people from the actual act of giving and it, um, you know, it doesn't prevent people from giving. This is, you know, your point in the book, basically, that, you know, why do we have to treat this as an either or in our modern society? We have a lot of money that's being given out by the government, and we have hundreds of billions of dollars a year that are being given out by private parties, and, and we have both. And, you know, that's this is a good answer to that. I still have enough money after my taxes that I can donate before. Um, but there is a crowding out effect, at least at, you know, high levels, you know, if we're talking about taxing 20% of my paycheck versus taxing 70% of my paycheck, there's going to be a big difference between my ability to help the poor if I'm facing one or the other of these tax rates. Um, so there is the crowding out problem. What are the other disadvantages of government doing this? Well, one of them, you know, like I said, there is the coercion aspect that the government, once the government gets involved in this and starts forcing people to do this, the coercion doesn't end neatly. Um, so looking at the healthcare example, again, my uh, Sorry, I'm taking too long. I worry. Um, my 
So my discipline, the extent to which I can call myself a scholar, I'm, I'm a scholar of uh, religious freedom and of law and religion. And you know, the, re the recent Hobby Lobby case is a great example of one of the costs of government provision of these goods and services, or of government requiring people um, to step in and help the poor. And that is, we have this health care law, the genuine purpose of which is to help is to help women by, by making sure they have free access to various um, uh, various preventive care that women need and men don't. Um, and this is intended to help the poor. But because of the way the government has gone about helping the poor, they're coercing a variety of people to do something, or they, they've tried to coerce a variety of people to doing things that they think are horribly, terribly, um, hideously wrong. Um, I think some of these people, you know, I don't share the religious beliefs of a lot of these people. I, I don't imagine that I would be objecting to this law if, they were in their, if I were in their shoes. Yet, nevertheless, the fact that the government and not um, and not private parties is doing the helping here has created a real con a real religious conflict for people that wouldn't exist otherwise. Um, anyway, so this is a I, I've talked around it a lot, but I, I guess what I'm getting at is, yeah, we need to make sure the poor get fed. Once they're you know, but but there are multiple ways to do this, and ones that maximize individual choice and maximize. Uh, you know, you know, you call it tribalism, but you know, maximize group forming and uh, the formation of you know, subsidiary organizations, um, Tokyo kind of stuff. Those, on the whole, in my opinion, will be better than the government program option, even if there's no way in our present society those on their own are going to get the job done. So that's that's my response to the forced charity isn't real charity and why should we care question. Um, the government that's capable of good is capable of bad things. You know, the solution to this is bureaucracy and inefficiency and, and such, and separation of powers. You could have added. I mean, our, you know, sure. I mean, I figured that right. was a given. But yeah. Right. You look at you look at the, the mess that is our national government right now, and the inability of Congress to get anything done. And uh, you know, th this was designed. Gridlock isn't always a bad thing. Right. right. This was planned. This was yeah. the Constitution was built to prevent a faction, one faction, from taking over. Um, and we have very factional politics today, and. It's, the fact that the factions can't cooperate makes sure that nothing happens, and that's that's designed into the system. This is a yeah. feature, not a bug. Um, but uh, I guess my two responses are: one, you know, bureaucracy isn't necessarily a protection, and checks and balances aren't necessarily a protection. Um, just because, you know, I, I served my mission in Germany, and the Germans invented bureaucracy, and they invented bureaucracy before Hitler. And Taylor used bureaucracy to, to pursue his means. It was not a check. Uh, lawyers were not a check. Judges were not a check. These were all tools of the Nazi state. Uh, and they end up being powers uh, for the Nazis rather than checks on them. Uh, but uh, beyond that, my answer is yeah, I, I agree with you. We need procedures. We need laws. We need lawyers tying things down in red tape for years. And, and this is how we prevent these efforts to do good for doing too much harm. So I, I agree, this is the case. This is an inevitable cost, a necessary cost of doing business through the government. Um, and uh, and it's one of the reasons why we'd all be better off if we as a society were better people and more charitable and more able to shoulder these burdens ourselves instead of um, putting it all on the government and then fighting over the government to see how the government does the job. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I think there's an undercurrent, Richard, of, of the subject of an empathy gap that you are trying to address in your lead book. I mean, put it that way. Um, first of all, we know the difference between empathy and sympathy, obviously, is the ability to put yourself in the person's shoes and feel what they feel. Now, it's easy for us to sit here at panel and, and Provo and intellectualize the whole problem because we're not the ones going on here. But, uh, and that's what I mean about empathy. So what's interesting to me is, uh, as Latter-day Saints have gone from a very poor society of pioneers to a point now where we actually in the middle of the upper class in terms of median income versus the rest of the country, our ability to empathize starts to go down. Uh, an interesting thing that I, that I found out is that the McClatchy uh, papers did a survey that found that the poor gave to the poor at twice the rate as the wealthy did. And not only that, but the middle class was even more of a type of uh, skin flank group than even the wealthy. And it's by a 2x. 
do the, the study was repeated by the University of Somali, essentially validating with one other, a third uh, study in Dubai, I can't remember the origin. So um, this whole empathy gap starts to go. And then Pamela Atkinson, you know, the anti-poverty person in Salt Lake, she, she said essentially the same thing, the poor understand the plight because they've been there. Now, this book, I think, is an attempt to close the empathy gap. A very tough thing to do. Um, part of the Bible where, where Christ says that the whole widow's might is still making it. And you can, you can argue that the wealthy gave a lot more money than the poor, and that's true. But the widow's might, lesson that we're taught by Christ, is that Christ essentially said, I'm not pressed with all these rich people giving all this money because they're giving of their abundance, that is, in excess of what they need and want. Whereas the widow gave essentially what she had. She's the one who's blessed in terms of Christ and so on. So, you know, we, again, we, the degree of empathy, and I know we you went to Finland and, and you had kind of this empathy gap too. You saw people who couldn't eat. You came back with not much of an empathy gap, if any. When I was a kid, my mother and my sister and I lived in poverty because my father was an alcoholic and he abandoned us. So we got to go into that whole story, but I empathize with people who can't hardly find a thing to eat or didn't have health insurance. My sister and I had to, couldn't go to the doctor when we had the measles because we didn't have health insurance and we couldn't afford to go on our own. So we were part of the working poor. And so as far as I'm concerned, my empathy gap was pretty small. I think what you're trying to do is, is close that. I know, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, I, mean, I think you, you've described well the situation of a lot of Latter-day Saints. You know, um, and you don't have to go back to the pioneers, you can go back to the 1930s, where many people in Utah were lower middle class, they were working class, and you know, going, going and working at the welfare farm made sense because you know, I could be the one next week who needs that welfare. I think it's a lot harder for our fellow church members today to get that sense that, oh no, I could actually be in that situation. I think there's you know, more of a stigma of, oh, that person's on welfare, you know, church welfare, government welfare, any kind of welfare. Uh, you know, there, there, there are all sorts of stereotypes that start to, to come up from that. And yes, I would like to deal with that, and particularly with this chapter about the poor. Uh, how we treat the poor says a lot about us as a society, and, and that's both as a society writ large and as a society of, of Latter-day Saints as well. And, uh, and it, it, it does it, it bother me, and again in the book, I talk about the, uh, how people contrast government welfare with church welfare, and basically say church welfare is, is great, you know, it's done the Lord's way, and government welfare is done, obviously, the other way. And, and suggest that those two are polar opposites. And I say, no, actually, they're complementary with each other. Uh, because the church welfare cannot serve very many people relative to the population of the world, or, or the United States, or even Utah, for that matter. I mean, can you imagine if there was no social security system, there was no uh, Medicaid system, if there were no food stamps, you know, the supplemental nutrition assistance program, could the church compensate for those? No, there's absolutely no way that that could happen. So it has a very limited kind of a scope. Uh, and, and, and more than that, we often think, we often say, well, the church welfare system, because it's, it's set up by the Lord, therefore it's run by people who are doing it in the right way, and there's not bureaucracy, and there's not waste. <laughs> now, I would agree that there are volunteers who run much of it, and they do, I think, have the best of heart for the most part, but that doesn't mean there isn't bureaucratic waste. That, but the, what's the difference here is that we don't see it, because the church is not transparent about these things. Government, on the other hand, must be transparent about these things, and so we see it, and it becomes public, and we, look, and we point at it as an example of how government is bad. Uh, and also, church, I mean, who, who runs the church welfare system? And what is our role as individual members in that system? Very small. I mean, uh, who, who, do we take a vote on who to help? No. It is a very small proportion of people, even in the church, 
who have any decision-making role. Now, contrast with government. What do we expect from government in terms of running the welfare system? We expect as citizens that we can tell our member of Congress what to do about welfare, and that we can vote them out of office if they don't do the way we want them to do. And, and the whole system is members of Congress in legislative oversight bring in these bureaucratic uh, uh, agency heads, and they grill them, and the program, and the budget, all there, out there. Uh, that's not the case with the church at all. And, and I'm not suggesting it should be. I, I'm just saying, when you try to compare these two systems, it just doesn't work. They're, they're, they're designed in different ways. They're run in different ways. Uh, and that, it, just because there is a church welfare system doesn't mean you don't need a government welfare system or the government welfare system is the opposite of the church welfare system. Matt? Uh, question. Today, in, in, a, in a couple of papers, uh, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox was quoted uh, some comments he made. I might have been with you. I don't remember where it was. He talked about uh, when he compared Congress to a dumpster fire. Talked about term limits. I thought he had some pretty good comments. Uh, I'd just be interested in your view regarding public service, uh, especially whether it's local or, or on a national level of elected officials. And, and for instance, what do you feel would, would help contribute to the ability of uh, the parties to work better together? Do you, do you feel like term limits would? Yeah, well, how much time do we have? This is a whole lecture. I don't want to get outside yeah. the purview of the message of your book. Yeah. Um, there, there, there are a lot of causes of the kinds of uh, uh, partisan gridlock that are going on right now. But getting back to your issue of public service, I, I hope that, that I encourage that in the book. I mean, I make that point about there's a chapter on civility and how we treated each other in the church when we disagree with one another. First, recognizing that we do disagree, that there are people in the pews sitting near us who don't think the same way that we do. How do we treat those people? Do we see them as foreigners, aliens, uh, not worthy to be there? Uh, that, that's, that's one. Uh, but another is we do need to be civically engaged. In fact, I, I quote President Benson on that uh, we need to be involved in our communities to, to be able to make a difference. I mean, I think Latter-day Saints should, should do this, but in a way that respects and tolerates and, and builds rather than the, the often the negativism. You know, I'm involved because, this is what some people say, I'm involved so I can save the Constitution because it's hanging from, by a thread. Because, why? Because these people who are running the government are evil, and I need to go in and help save it. That, that kind of that kind of public service involvement motivation is is not very good because you see everything in, in these uh, good and evil terms, and that's not really how most of the world works. Um, um, and I don't believe that government that service is the only way that you can serve. Um, I would like to encourage people to, to get engaged in government service, but an example is what we were talking about before the the debate commission. So I've been involved in setting up this commission that uh, hosted the debate that took place last night, once next uh, tomorrow night, and three more coming. Uh, it's all private. Uh, it's it's not there are no government funds. Um, all the people are doing it uh, because they want to make a difference, and it's all outside of the realm of government. So I think that you can you should be involved in in government. You should be involved in non-government. Uh, I think there are places for, for all of us to be involved, but that involvement should be driven by the sense of empathy, an understanding of others, a view of the world that is broader than my own neighborhood, you know, my own street, my own ward, uh, and, and it should be driven by a sense that I want to use government to, in, in good ways, and that I, and I don't see government as just fundamentally bad, um, because I think those sorts of people just want to go in and tear it down. Um, uh, it was Grover Norquist, who's a, uh, uh, I can't remember what group, he's Taxpayers Union or something like that, who said, you know, what I want to do is take government and make it smaller and then take it to the bathtub and drown it. <laughs> uh, he certainly has the right to have that kind of motivation, but I don't think that's, 
the kind of motivation that, that people ought to have. Yeah. So it's, it's funny. Um, <clears throat> this is probably surprising, but actually this is part of the, the part of the book that I found myself disagreeing with the most. <laughs> Um, the, the civic engagement part, and that is, I tend to think that uh, civic engagement today, at least, well, one, I, I think the, the villainizing and de you know, um, demonizing, um, all that, I mean, this is how this works, that's how this has always worked. I mean, I've never, I, has there ever been a democracy where that wasn't the currency of the realm? You know, you know, one, you know both sides, you know, the, the way they, either side would win is, they pick one set of people that they're, going to, that they're going to say are evil and not destroy everybody, and they're going to pick another set of people and tell soft stories about them. And and you know, and if, if you find if you find one side's set of evil people and soft stories compelling, you go to the one side, and you find the other side's set of evil people and soft stories compelling, you go to that side. And that's that's how it works. Um, and and that to me is a cost of, of doing so much stuff through government. You know, I hardly wishes people didn't think government mattered so much because I think the time spent. Time people spend on national politics, by and large, could have could have been spent in much more productive ways. You can do so much more good um, locally, you know, uh, and, and government or you know, or civic nonprofit, what have you. Um, you know, I could I could spend my whole life trying to influence federal politics, and and if I could point to one decision that one congressman made at some point because I was you know because I was involved in exerting influence, you know. I'd say it's probably a pretty successful career if they're trying to influence politics. Actually, swinging in the outcome of a congressional election, I think, is, is beyond the means of me or, or nearly anybody whose net worth is you know, fewer than nine figures. Um, so, I, to, to me, this is a distraction. To me, I, I think, yeah, people should vote because people's failure to vote is what makes the rile up the base strategy so successful. If all the moderates were voting, then you'd have to try to capture the moderates, but because the moderates don't vote, you have to try to rile up the base. Okay, so that that problem I definitely see, but, but I, I don't imagine that people who get involved in national politics thereby become better neighbors, thereby become more concerned about the, the poor, uh, the people that they can actually influence and help. Um, I think it's much likely to be the opposite. I think it's if, if I've spent all my time trying to do good by keeping those those evil insert party name here out of the White House, that then I'm off the hook. I don't need to worry about this. I I, I did my civic duty, and the fact that that the library or the homeless shelter in my community is about to close down, well, somebody else can worry about that because I worry about national politics. So. So I'm, I'm a, a localist on this. I, I, I don't think the federal government is a good focus for our, our, our civic energies. Any other questions?